Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event hosted by the Royal Society of Edinburgh Post-Covid Futures Commission. Bit of a mouthful, I'm sorry about that. My name is Anne Glover, and I'm the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And let me just tell you a little bit about the Royal Society of Edinburgh. We're Scotland's National Academy, and we were founded in 1783. So we've been around for a long time. And as Scotland's National Academy, we have a main purpose. And that, if I put it in a nutshell, our purpose is to make knowledge useful for everyone in Scotland and, and indeed further afield. And we do that by having uh, or being able to use the expertise of our over 1600 elected fellows, uh, each of whom represents excellence in their own area. And our fellows come from academia, the sciences, engineering, the arts and humanities. Uh, they come from the arts and the culture, our cultural uh, endeavours in Scotland. They come from public life and they come from business. So really the, the best of Scotland uh, we have amongst our fellowship. And, and that's what we're aiming to harness. Now, in May of this year, and it's been a very strange year for all of us, we launched a post-COVID Futures Commission. And the purpose of that commission is to try and identify how the future can be better than our past. And we had to narrow down on specific areas that we could tackle as Scotland's National Academy. And also, we looked at what other people were doing and tried not to duplicate. So we picked four main areas. And the first is building national resilience. And I think we can all understand why that is important. We've had a shock this year from uh, coronavirus, but there will be many other shocks to come. So we should be ready for them. The second area that we looked at was data, evidence and science. And how do we use data? How do we use evidence? Where does science fit in? Because we know it's been particularly important in our ability to both understand uh, coronavirus and be able to offer treatments and potentially vaccines uh, for this particular pandemic. And then uh, we were looking at inclusive public service. So how do our public services work? And how can they actually work for the people they're intended to help? And listen to them so that we can tailor make something better than perhaps the overarching top-down approach that we've seen historically. And then the last area that we've looked at is public debate and participation. And this event particularly looks at that because um, during COVID, bringing health messages to a public in a quite unprecedented way has been a new challenge for many. And we've heard lots of different voices and our panel today brings great expertise in communication from the arts, from the humanities and from the sciences. So we've got a wealth of experience uh, to discuss. So, uh, let me tell you how the event will play out. We hope to have a conversation and also that you will be part of that and you will join in and you can ask questions during our conversation by using the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Now, inevitably, with so many of you registered, we have over 300. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to answer all of the questions, but we'll try to include those in our conversation. Uh, this is also being recorded, and so you'll be able to listen again, watch again, and hopefully tell others if you've enjoyed our conversation and they can share at a later event. So what I would like to do now is I would like to introduce each of our guests. And I'm going to do that by telling you a little about them. And then we're going to hear a short clip of them communicating. And I'll introduce uh, all three guests 
and then we'll get into having a conversation uh, about how we how do we communicate during a crisis and what different styles there are and what we can learn from that. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the first guest who is uh, Mona Siddiqui and Mona is the professor of uh, Islamic and interreligious inter studies at Edinburgh University. She looks at law, ethics, and also Christian Muslim interaction and uh, is quite a frequent broadcaster. And many of you will have heard her on Radio 4 Today programme, Thought for the Day, and also on the Moral Maze. So let's hear a little from Mona. Thank you there from Mona. And now I am delighted to introduce my second guest, uh, Jason Leach. And Jason is the Scottish Government National Clinical Director. Um, you will have seen him as a very familiar face at the First Minister's briefings on coronavirus, which we, we've seen over this past nine months. And Jason has a, a background also in dentistry and oral surgery. So let's hear from Jason. Jason, thank you for that. Uh, a nice clip there from uh, Off the Ball. And my last guest, I'm very pleased to introduce to you, Janie Godley, again, who has had uh, tremendous prominence during coronavirus, uh, partly due to her voiceovers uh, uh, with the First Minister's briefings again. And Janie is a comedian, an actor and a writer. And uh, she has most recently done some really interesting stuff with the National Theatre of Scotland, the the alone uh, cameo plays, which have uh, really been uh, very well received uh, during coronavirus. So um, let's hear from Jenny. Hi there, Nicola here. Well, it's Thursday and I'm over the moon because I finally got my grey roots done. I started to look like a tawny owl and it's been cut with a pair of nail scissors for three months, so it's looking fabulous. I just want to say that I'm so happy that we can get back to our wee bed and breakfast and our hotels. And me, big Philomena McClatchy, Bridie McBride and Isa McNamee, we're all heading down the caravan this week at Craig Tara. Can I wait? going to get the Prosecco and the feet up. But I want to speak about people's mental health. You all know that we've been through a really trying time since March and everybody is frazzled and I know we're all going to keep the heat, but can everybody stop shouting at each other about your face mask is wrong, that doesn't look like it's covering your mouth right? Just all try and be a wee bit kinder to each other. And don't forget, people are going to be worried sick about their kids going back to school. So all oh, let's take a wee breather and be nice to each other and the kids can head down the park this weekend and that's going to be a good thing. So keep on a mask, but smile behind it. Archie, what say you? Yeah, I'm out of the moon, Nicola. I can get back to my rollerblading and my figure skating, which is my favourite thing. You know yourself, I've been practising all, all this summer in the house, so the neighbours downstairs will be out of the moon. Do you want to come rollerblading with me, Nicola? No, that's weird. Right, are you a journalist? You ...to make sure people can work and trade without barriers, for example, between over the border between Scotland and England. And why has your party described these plans as a paragraph? Eh, you were told these briefings are about COVID-related and no party politics. But no, you still insist it. So get off my telly. That's your tell. Right. Everybody, I am so proud of all the children of Scotland who absolutely stuck to the rules and we are coming out of lockdown slowly. It is frightening. The virus is still there. It's no gone away, but we're all doing our best. So all I can ask you is to make sure you wash your hands, stay away two metres and don't go into a crowd at play. See you all here on Tuesday. Right, well, my clicky pen. Ow, ow, feet are killing me. Frank, get the door. I want a wee fish supper the night with some sweet corn. And thank you, Janie. And so can I invite for the big reveal, uh, Mona, Janie and Jason just to reveal themselves. 
Hello, uh, we've heard from you and each of you has a distinctive voice. And if, if I had to think about, because I've listened to all of you during uh, lockdown and Janie's made me laugh, uh, Mona's made me think, and I guess Jason's made me listen. Uh, so, but not just that, because I think each of you's made me listen and to think about things perhaps in a way that I haven't before. So communication is very powerful, but it's, it's complicated as well. Um, I'd like to, Jason, just come to you first of all, and, and to ask you a little bit about the fact that you've been thrown into the limelight. I guess that you're recognized everywhere you go uh, in, in Scotland, most certainly, uh, because people have, have seen so much of you over these past nine months. Um, did you have to think about that when you were doing the communication and indeed, when you adopted your style of communication, is it something that was consciously in your mind or is it just you? you you'd probably have to ask others about the authenticity, but th thank, thank you for having me. It's terrific to be here and what great company to be. And I just laughed again at Janie's, honestly. I think Janie's done more for public health advice than I have in, in 11 months, to be absolutely honest. I think her 90 seconds is better than my hour and a half. And I've also just learned that I need to talk in shorter answers on off the ball. That is a very long answer about car sharing. I think I'm going to be correct at this Saturday. The content was good though, but it was a bit long. So I haven't, I haven't consciously tried to, 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 to do a certain style or I, I I've, I've said this before in, in, in publicly that I, I've tried to tell the truth. I mean, that, that might seem like an odd thing for a public health advisor to say, but one of the challenges is that the Daily Mail or Good Morning Britain or whoever wants to do it can find something I said in March that makes little sense in December. So the, the simplest way to avoid that is either to be interviewed only once or, or to be so vague and, and so non-specific that they can repeat it forever. I've, I've chosen not to do that. So, so I've chosen to try and answer the question. I'm asked to tell the truth as I know it on that day. I've got slightly better at saying, well, on the 17th of December, the advice is. So I've got better at the whole quote than I, than I was in February or March, particularly. But I, I, I've, I've been a communicator, a kind of academic clinical communicator for years. I was just anonymous. Nobody cared except the poor oral surgery students who had to learn how to take cancer tumours off or how to take wisdom teeth out. But the public bit is new for me. And, and I've, 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 learned from, I've learned from your two other guests. I've learned from politicians. I've learned from media how, how to maybe do it in a way that people understand. And the, the only other thing I'd say quickly, Anne, is I've also had to learn that there is a science to not necessarily how you communicate, but the, the route you use. So it was illustrated by somebody, we were trying to do something in open and, and the communications experts came back and said, no, no, you're wasting your time here. You need to get it in the open times. Everybody in open reads the open times. Mm -hmm. I said, no, surely not. They said, no, no, that's, that's how you speak to open. And that's not how you speak to Orkney. In Orkney, you get on Radio Orkney at six o'clock. Every day, the whole of Orkney, listen to Radio Orkney. So you, so you have to adapt your, your message, but also your route to, to whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Do you, do you like it? Do you enjoy communicating? I, I, I do in the main. So, so yes, I, I, I am an extrovert thinker. I, I quite like the, the, the ability to offer something purpose. I think in COVID, particularly all of us have sought purpose. I mean, it's probably what we do all the time in our lives anyway, but to have something you can do in this work is hugely important, I think, to all of us. I, J Janie, Janie might have more to say about it, but I imagine it, it, Janie switching her comedy partly to be about this is partly to give her a purpose inside the pandemic. I mean, that, that's, got to, that's got to be a good thing for all of us. The Royal Society of Edinburgh are setting up a, a new work stream around COVID. That's to give you purpose, something that you are, you can uniquely do. And there, there's lots of public health leaders in the country. There's lots of people working much harder than me at the front line of the contact tracing work or the test and protect work. But there aren't that many people who get to stand at the podium beside the first minister. And therefore that 
set of skills, I, I think I think is quite important. Now, others can judge whether Gregor and I are doing that well or badly or more mixed than that, which is probably the truth. But yeah, I, I do enjoy it. I don't like the negative side of it, when we might come to that, that there is there is attack, there is politics, there is there is some there are some there's some unkindness in there that I, I don't revel in, if I'm totally honest. But yes, in the main it's given me a purpose and I think I've got better at it as time has passed. Thanks, Jason. So I'm when I'm listening to that, I'm thinking, um, Janie, coming to you, um, there are a lot of comedians have become highly visible during uh, the pandemic. And if I, I think, well, obviously yourself, I'm thinking of others such as uh, Michael Spicer or Sarah Cooper, who have done different sorts of kind of voiceovers. And I would say that their, their comedy be, can be quite harsh. It's quite hard hitting politically, and it's not necessarily trying to convey information about coronavirus. Um, and there are other voices that we've heard, such as um, one that I'm fond of is the, the sports journalist, Andrew Cotter and Olive and Mabel, uh, because that's very gentle. And sometimes you just need something extremely kind and gentle to make you, to make you smile. But, Jenny, your voice has become very distinctive, uh, partly initially through those voiceovers uh, from the First Minister. And sometimes when I'm listening to them, I think I could probably miss the First Minister's briefing and then just listen to your bit at the end, because that's what I need to know. Uh, so what motivated you to do that? Uh, I mean, is it just part of your artistic flair? Um I have been doing the voiceovers for four years. I was on tour with the voiceover show before um, coronavirus kicked in. In fact, the very day coronavirus kicked in, I had to cancel three sold out shows at the King's Theatre. So then I saw the First Minister doing the, and by the way, I thought his name was Alan and the other guy was called uh, Stephen. I gave everybody different names. Um, so then when I saw the First Minister's briefings, I decided to just voice them over because there wasn't a lot else happening. And it's really hard to voice over Boris and make him look, you know, funny or whatever, because he's Boris. So um, I realized that getting the message out was quite important because I wasn't going to go up there when she was talking about death. She was talking about the figures of people who have contacted it, the people who are in ICU. So it's a very dark matter. So I try and skip the video right along to where she wasn't speaking about that. And then just get, what what was this whole hour and a half or whatever about? We've got journalists who I love, by the way, I have to hijack this conversation and say, I wish I'd studied as a journalist. When do you think this is gonna end? Do you know when this stops? See next year, do you think we can go to Salt Coast? I'm like, why are they asking these questions? So that was funny and it's helped some of it. Um, so I decided that to cut through all the blah, 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 and her face having to go, I can't believe I've got to answer this again. Just say the basics and make it funny. Like she would open up with, this is my wee Pippa D top that I got on there. Catherine got it for a wedding last year. And it was just like, if you imagine a wee woman at a bus stop called Teresa or Jeanette, and you said to them, did you watch the brief in the day? Aye. What did you get for it? Well, did you see that jacket she was wearing? Ah, it's not a Colorado war. But it turns out that we've got to wear a mask. We've not even here, folk. We've to stay two Alsatians apart because folk don't know what meters are. I come from the pre-decimal <laughs> generation. Two Alsatians apart because everybody knows the size of an Alsatian. And uh, that big fella, Alan, to call Alan, uh, he's saying that we've ought to make sure we wear a mask and wash our hands, and that's why. So I just thought, if I do it like that, it'll be funny. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that it would become that important. And then there was this big, compelling thing, when you get up and do a voiceover, folk might die. No, I just did it because, basically, I'm just a stupid, uneducated woman in the house with a phone and a voice. That's the God's honest truth. And I make myself laugh. Well, that, that's good to hear. But so are you thinking of moving over to the journalists and doing some voiceovers of what they're doing? I, I did do some of the journalists and the voiceovers, you know, that some of them asked the most ridiculous questions and I would frame them and then add 
Nicholas Ancelot. Oh, son, I don't know because I don't have a crystal ball. Why are you asking me that? <laughs> the journalist questions will go down in history. People should compile them all together. And like, yeah. A man, a man in New York wrote an article and said that if you wear uh, slippers on a Tuesday, you don't catch it on a Wednesday. I mean, it's that ridiculous. So I've just had a bit of fun with it. And if people are listening to the message because of my big giant mouth, then maybe something worked. Okay, so um, then I'm thinking, because we're hearing very different ways to approach communication, I guess. And uh, Mona, I, I, I want to ask you now, I'm thinking about um, the things that you do. I mean, I, I mentioned that you did Thought for the Day. And uh, so I listened to you in the mornings and then I listened to you again at night in the moral maze. Um, but what you're doing all the time, and I suppose you, you're one of Scotland's uh, best known intellectual thinkers. So what you're challenging us is to think about things. And the moral maze clip that we heard was all about um, the availability of vaccines. Uh, at the time, I think we didn't have one available, but you know, it was on the horizon. And some of the ethics around, would you compel people to be vaccinated and so on? So you were, you were trying to take us through that conversation and uh, to get us to think about things. Um, do you, when you do that, do you get feedback from people either on thought for the day or um, you know, on things like the moral maze or other broadcasting that you do? Do people get in touch with you? Yeah, they do actually. And I just to pick up on what Jason and uh, Janie were saying, and it's a real privilege to be to be on such a lovely panel, actually. Um, you know, so many of us are spending so much time at home and we're looking for some kind of entertainment. And at a time when the news feed is constantly and quite rightly talking about the virus and the tier system and what's allowed and what's not allowed, so much of it is repetition. So you're really hearing the same kind of stuff in different ways, whether it's on your phone or in front of the screen or whatever. And so therefore, in order to make your voice heard or your message, you really have to cut through that because there are so many people at the same time talking about the same kind of stuff. And I feel that you know when I'm listening to either Janie or Jason or whoever else that I think has got a message, it's because they've cut through that. They may not think they've cut through that, but they've actually cut through the thousands of people who are commenting on every little thing that we're hearing about every little aspect of COVID-19. So when I, when I speak, and I am in no way speaking about COVID-19 or, or politics all the time, but my sense is that our uh, public discourse has become so polarized on social media. You're either with us or you're against us or you're right wing or you're left wing. There's constantly a culture war going on. And it's a made up culture war because I don't think most people want it. Um, but you have to say something that actually resonates with people and makes them think beyond the immediate. So yes, of course, the UK was the first country to um, get access to so many of the vaccinations. But is that it? Is that what we have to be jingoistic about? Is that really, is that our contribution to the vaccine? My concern is more that, you know, in the clip that you played is that how do we then make sense of this should be a wake up call for all of us as to when there might be another issue or situation like this? And how are we prepared globally? This isn't a, this isn't an inter-country war. This is about global health. And so you should always be thinking that if, if this year has taught us anything, is how interconnected we are, not only nationally, but internationally, mm -hmm. and how the health of the people over there should matter to the people over here. Yeah, so that, that's interesting because you were mentioning there also social media. And um, I think I follow all of you on Twitter. And, and it's kind of interesting because Twitter is a, if you like, it's an egalitarian medium in that everybody's got access to it and everybody can have an account on Twitter and you can, as, as we all do, you can have an account that is you with your name on it and it's clearly you. Uh, but lots of people have accounts where they are anonymous and that appears to give them the ability to be Un unbelievably rude 
and nasty to people. And uh, I think, I, I don't know, Mona, if you've uh, experienced that kind of reaction on Twitter, but I most definitely know that uh, I have, Jason has, and, and Janie has. But Mona, have you yeah. received sort of abuse well, on Twitter? I'm just, I'm just conscious that I didn't actually answer the first question you asked me about feedback, which was to say that uh, actually I've been lucky because I think I try to... I try not to do politics. I try not to take sides. I try to, whatever I say on Twitter is kind of quite neutral in some sense or personal. Um, but the feedback I get, I would say 99%, whether it's on Moral Maze or Thought for the Day, I've been fortunate, it's good feedback. I think that if you're going to, I, I, I would stress one thing though, that we underestimate how violence is always near us. You know, it's whether it's in our language or physical violence, we think that civilization has made us not become violent, but you only have to look at the abusive stuff some people get on Twitter to see how easily violent some people can become. And language is always weaponized and language, language isn't just about words, it, it has consequences. Um, so I think, you know, especially for people like Janie and Jason, I think it's extremely brave to be going out there, whatever, your intention is, you know, whatever your, whoever your audience is, but to be putting yourself out in the public and just saying something, it, it lifts some people, but some people will resent you and hate you for trying to make things nicer or trying to get people to laugh and smile a bit. And so I think that's partly because social media has allowed anonymity, but even when there isn't anonymity, a lot of people are very proud to say horrible things and to be seen to be saying horrible things. And I think we have underestimated the power of language and that social media isn't just this friendly, neutral space. Um, so yeah, I think you have to be very courageous to go, whether it's in public or on social media, which is another form of public and say what you want to say. Yeah, and, and actually, I so I'm thinking, you know, at one point, uh, because of what I was doing in my life, I got a lot of trolling and unpleasantness on social media. And because I'd never been subject to that before, I mean, of course, I'd met nasty people in life, but, you know, generally not the onslaught. And um, I find it extremely hard. I mean, I used to lie awake at night worrying about it or wondering about it and um, and perhaps even doubting myself at times. And the the thing that worked for me was uh, it was actually my husband reminding me that um, the same used to happen to Tony Benn, a Labour politician who unfortunately is, uh, is dead now. But he'd said in one of his uh, autobiographical works that it didn't matter if these people said bad things about you because they don't know you. What matters if somebody who really knows you well says a bad thing about you, then you've got to worry. But that simple thing that he said to me just immediately fixed it overnight. I never gave a moment's thought to, to all this abuse that came through, which fortunately doesn't happen to me at the moment. But but Jenny, does that strike a bell with you and how you deal yeah. with, because you get vitriolic trolling, I can't help but notice. Um, yeah, it's, it's a brilliant saying and I, I say it, you know, when people say you're fat and ugly and I hate you. I'm like, my husband loves me, my daddy loved me, my daughter loves me. I don't want, and they'll say, we hate you and we don't like you. Well. I don't want them to like me. Imagine they were my friends. You know, <laughs> that's what I always think. When when I was when Ashley was wee and she went to school and the mean girls used to bully her, I and they used to say things to her like, "We don't like you." And I used to say to Ashley, "Good, you never want those people to like you." So when they come online, I mean, my dog got a death threat the other day, which was funny. Mm -hmm. He misgendered my dog and he wanted it dead. And I think you don't. It, it, you can't say you love me because you don't know me. And equally, you can't say you hate me because you don't know me, you know? And, and yeah, I argue back, you know, that's the problem. It's not a problem for me, but they don't like it when you argue back. It's, it's an old tribal, and it's mostly men, but not all. And it's not all men either, but it's a tribal thing. And I knew it because I recognized that when I had the pub, I'd stand behind the bar and these wee old men would say things and I would answer back and they'd be like, you know, they say things like, you're really fat, you're putting the weight on. I'm like, mate, I'm nine stone and you could tie three of you together and launch a boat. I don't understand why my weight is important to you when I'm only pouring pints for you and you've got, you know, quite a lot of cholesterol issues going on. They go, 
you're not allowed to say that. And I was like, where, where, where were you born that you were allowed to say something and you weren't allowed to speak back? And Twitter's like that. Twitter's like a close years ago when people go up and write up the close, like, Janie's a fat bitch. And then somebody rubs it out and somebody says, no, it's very similar to that. But no, I mean, I do get death threats and I do get threatened and I get men coming to me saying that they're going to follow me in my work. And, and yet it never stopped me. I went on the tube myself and I'd walk to work myself and... They don't frighten me, you know, and I don't know why they don't frighten me, but they don't because I, I, I was brought up in a pub and it's the person that doesn't speak and doesn't say anything that you have to be scared of. So, yeah, you get a lot of anger and I say a lot of crap back as well. And then they're like, you shouldn't have said that. I was like, mate, I'm hitting my menopause. I'm tired. I'm in COVID times. Can you go annoy somebody else, you know? And it is what it is, but it's politics, tribal Football and misogyny um, is a very toxic mix. You put all them together and you've got one big bundle of hate. But then on the other side of that, I have so much love from people. I, I think we tend to focus and there's something that we do in social media and I'm very guilty of it. I can have 700 people say, I love your work. One person can say, I hate you. And I'm like, and it's the same in live audiences, though. Ashley and I were talking about this last night. I can stand on stage. There could be 700 people in the audience, and I'll spot one man with his arms folded, and the whole gang's gone to crap because I need to make him laugh. So it's a psychological thing as well. But, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't um, let myself get bullied by it. And I know that I'm loved. I've been married 40 years to a man who loves me. I've got a daughter who loves me, and my daddy loved me, and nobody can take that away from me. So that that's a, a really good way of dealing with it. But I'm I'm wondering how you deal with it, Jason, because you you also get a lot, maybe slightly different. And I, I think that my experience has been that when people want to be nasty to women, um, they hardly ever, you know, what they talk about is our appearance or the fact that they wouldn't go out with you in a million years or whatever. It's 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 very bizarre. They they kind of typify you, and I, I I think all the three women here we've probably all had that. Jason, maybe not so much for you that they target your appearance, but you could tell us about that. But one of the things that Janie has, and in fact all of us have, that you don't have, is that you're not able to answer back. So how does that? How does that play out for you? Yeah, it, so so the, the I, I think the abuse is slightly different. Let me let me start positively though. There's a wonderful joy. Jane, Janie's right. I mean, I get I get clips of it, babies falling asleep to my adverts because it's the only thing that will put them to sleep, or or kids playing with toys and then they suddenly turn their head around to watch the briefing because the voice gathers them. The, the two year olds is not really my target audience, so maybe I should re redirect some of the comms but I also do get quite quite nasty abuse I get a little bit of appearance stuff so my mother will be ashamed that there are people who call me scruffy I think it's in comparison to Gregor in his three-piece suit but it, it is you get a bit of that but not the same misogynist nonsense that either the first minister or Gene Freeman or or the guests here get which is just sickening I, I get quite a lot of uh, politics so I get half the crowd thinking I'm a raging unionist and half the crowd thinking I'm a raging nationalist, depending on the hour of the day or the nature of the <laughs> debate or whatever it is we're doing. Uh, neither are right, of course. I'm not a raging I, either of those things. Uh, I, and the nature of my job means that I, I can only answer back to a certain extent. So I can answer questions on the telly, but if I'm attacked by certain individuals in the population I, I, I cannot answer back because it breaks the civil service code so I, so I have I have restrictions I am very very grateful for Janie Godley existing because Janie Godley despite me not having to tell her sometimes answers on my behalf which I absolutely love so she sometimes jumps into my defense to, to help me out the the, the, the real hatred I've, I've a bit like Janie and Mona I've, I've learned to it's, I've had to do it pretty quickly, but I've learned to ignore it. So that if somebody tweets a gif of gallows and you're going to be held, a, I, honestly, I, I, that doesn't bother me anymore. I can I can miss it out. But the, the ones that get under my skin still, and maybe it, maybe it's to Janie's point about the one in the crowd who's not laughing. The ones that get me are the ones that, that suggest my motives are somehow wrong, mm -hmm. that I'm somehow not doing my best, 
that, that this thing I'm doing about care homes is because I want old people to die because I just don't care. They are the ones that still get me. Yeah. And that's hard. I don't, I don't quite know how to deal with that psychology other than to keep telling the truth, doing your best, give the best advice you can and, and keep going. But the, the real hatred, the real vitriol that doesn't bother me anymore. I'll tell you a very quick story that did make me laugh though. So I'm feeling quite pleased with myself and my profile and I've got all this good comms going out there and it's all going well. And people stop me in the street now and people are lovely. People are universally lovely. And two lovely ladies, I was out running and they stopped me at my gate and they said, we just wanted to say you're doing a fantastic job. Are you the guy off the telly? And I said, yes, but thanks for stopping me. Thanks, I'm really, that it's really touching that you've, and they said, no, you're, you're doing great. We listen every day and we think you're great and we listen to your advice and we pass it on to our friends. I said, thank you so much. They turned their back and walked away and one of them looked back and said, thanks very much, Gregor. <laughs> So actually, it was Gregor's advice they were listening to, not mine at all. Okay. Well, at least they were listening. I think that's the important Quite. thing. But, Quite. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just, I'm going to come and pick up uh, one of the questions that's coming in. And this is a, a question to all of you in the panel. And it's from Louise McDonald, um, who's the chief executive of Young Scott. So uh, I think you'll know where the question's going. And she's asking, do the panel have any thoughts about how we need to differentiate our communications with young people? And how do we engage them more centrally in public debate? So, um, and Louise also serves on our um, post-COVID Futures Commission as well. So how do, how do we deal with young people? Any thoughts? Yeah, Jenny. Um, I have started for about six months now doing videos through my wee sausage dog speaking to children, ones where there's no swearing and there's no, you know, no innuendo. And what I'll do is I'll get wee honey to eat a carrot and her wee mouth goes, and then I'll get her to speak to the kids and say things like, I know it's frightening and I know you can't see your granny. And, and then I have done lots of personal without anybody knowing. You know, somebody will say, my wee boy's really upset and I'll send them a wee honey video and I think that through wee honey we are wee funny boys talking I mean that's very young children but people love wee honey who by the way in real life absolutely hates children which is interesting and um but I think that the way we the way we speak to younger people and approach them there is so many more mediums out there things like twitch twitch streams are huge with the younger generation. I know my daughter has one and there's a lot of people have discourse sites on there where they can chat about anxiety, depression. So what I'm trying to say in the answer is, is young people are finding their own way to find their own people and talk amongst themselves and offer each other support. But how the government and how the health people do it, um, I, I, I have no idea about that. Just through my wee dog is how I try to do it. Um, and, and she stopped swearing, which is really good news. So, so Louise, is, Louise is the clear expert. That's why she asks the question, of course. But Louise's organisation has been crucial in the COVID response, not to spare our blushes, but young Scott has played an absolute blinder. The guidance is almost immediately moved into, not quite translated for young people, but moved into routes that young people use. And again, it's about learning where people get their information, where the trusted sources are. I've done, I've done some Q&A stuff with them, with, with and without the First Minister. We've, I, I believe it, they've used me for TikTok videos. I can't think of anything worse. I don't even fully understand what it means, but nonetheless, and, and we've done quite a lot in schools. So, so you, 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 you go to where the, the, the customer is, and you ask the customer. So, so what? What do twelve-year-olds? What do twelve-year-olds need? What do six-year-olds need to, to understand this world we're living in? And then I've spent quite a bit of time with the NUS, with particularly with the return to students, and now the students going home again. We spent a lot of time with the student population, trying to understand what will work best for them. And and sometimes it is the fifty-two-year-old guy doing doing a little video for their graduation. And sometimes it's their peer group doing it, or it's the first minister answering questions. So whatever it whatever it might be, I think I think use use the voices you have available to you. And young Scott, don't do anything. They teach you not to do anything until you've asked the young people, and that seems to me to be the crucial step that we often miss out. 
So, so co-design it, or even better, get the young people to design it and then offer them the resource. We're moving so fast that sometimes that's not as easy as it sounds, but Young Scott, YouthLink, other organisations around schools and universities have been absolutely crucial to get that communication across. Yeah. So, M Mona, would you, I, and I'm thinking about, um, I mean, you really do, and, and a lot of the broadcasting you do, you you provoke people to think. Um, but if I was to judge, I think um, some of your audiences might be, I, I suppose, more mature. I don't know, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm not talking about the young people, no. basically. And uh, what Jason said really strikes a chord with me because uh, it bothers me that we pay so little attention to young people, whether it's to do with the climate crisis, uh, because it's their future we're ruining, uh, economic crisis, it's their future we're ruining. And even during COVID, I mean, we, we do obviously talk about the tragedy of care homes, but what about the tragedy of young people who can't interact with each other, their brains don't develop as they should do because they need that social interaction to become the adults that, that we'll uh, benefit from in our society. So how do, how do we get discourse to engage with young people and to give them a voice? I mean, I suppose, first of all, there's different levels of young people. And even if we're looking at young adults, I think I've been saying this for the past few months, actually, that I think we've underestimated. We talk about it, all oh, mental health, but I think we've underestimated how much young people, whether they're at university or higher up in secondary school or even you know, in primary school, have actually, I wouldn't say suffered necessarily, but I can't think of another word because mm -hmm. They get criticism for, oh, they're not resilient enough. You know, back in my day, we had to put up with this. But for so many people of a certain generation, freedom and friendship and socializing is all they've known. And so to, to criticize them for what they've grown up with, I think is really quite immoral, to be honest. And to have that freedom and that, that level of friendship, I think we live in a very friendship-based culture taken away where you're physically not meeting anyone, you're not socializing in any way, uh, you're constantly at the mercy of which tier system you're going to be in and what's going to be shut down. I, I know very, very able, very secure young people who are, are completely changed by this. And I don't know how they're going to come out of this. And one of the things I think is that they also need to take ownership of some of these debates because the pressures we're going to face even if the vaccine works effectively in the next few months, and I hope it does, we are going to face ongoing pressures uh, across society. And young people, you know, irrespective of, you know, whether they're in their 20s or late teens or early teens, in some ways they have to take ownership because that's all they're listening to at the moment, COVID and the consequences of COVID. But they're almost uh, not necessarily victims, but they're just being told this is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are going to go out there, make the money, make society, carry us on into the next 20, 30 years. I think we need to see them more publicly have conversations. At the moment, they're just being told all the time. And I think that even from a very small perspective, which is a university perspective, I can see the kind of deflation there is in so many students as to this isn't what we signed up for. And they're not criticizing the education, they're criticizing the whole system the experience that they've lost out on. And even if it's limited as to what we can do, I don't think we're doing enough. Yeah. Um, what about the, the, um, this resilience thing? Because you, you said there that, you know, people criticize kids for, for not being resilient enough. And in fact, one of our themes in the Post-COVID Futures Commission is building national resilience. And it's being led by um, uh, Professor Sirian Boyd, who was a chief scientific advisor to UK government uh, in environment for many years. And he wrote an interesting kind of provocative piece as part of the commission offering, where he was highlighting that in New Zealand, and I think, Janie, you know Z New Zealand quite well, and I think they like you a lot uh, from all the awards that you've won there. But um, what the New Zealand government website says is in the event of an emergency, and it can be any emergency, whether it's a natural disaster or something like uh, coronavirus, 
um, they say, do not expect the government to be able to respond for at least two days. So what they're saying is you're on your own, whatever happens, if it's an earthquake or whatever, you're on your own for two days. Yeah. And as a result, the population of New Zealand from a very early age in primary school, secondary school, young people are, I suppose, tutored or offered um, teaching around being resilient. And of course, we don't do that because we live in a control society where we tell you what's good for you and we expect you to do it. So, I mean... But I, but I also think, there and that we live in a... Uh, and I know Janie's got a hand up, so I'll just be brief. No, no. But we live in a society which is which on the one hand is constantly polarizing opinions, but on the other hand, in the educational system, right from school onwards, we're told we can't moralize. We can't really tell people how to live life. We can't really tell that, you know, there is good and bad. We tell it in very obscure, oblique ways. And I think that, you know, so many young people that I know say that what, whichever school they went to, whichever education system they went through, they may have learned a lot in terms of qualifications, but they would have liked other things about how does one actually cope with things? This is, you know, we're gonna face, we always face different kinds of disasters. This is the first one that we're going through collectively, which is so visual and so visceral in some ways. But so many young people say, you know, we want to be told, you know, we, not that they want to be moralized all the time, but some of the life skills, that is exactly what you're referring to. And irrespective of that, I think that what the pandemic has shown is so many young people are willing to help they are willing to do community stuff. They are willing to sacrifice their freedoms. And I just don't think we talk enough about that to give credit where credit's due. Okay. So I've, got a, I've got a dentistry example for you, Anne. So, so for years, we've been trying to get off the bottom of the league table for dental decay in under fives for years. We've been the worst country in Western Europe and we've tried everything. We've tried communicating with parents. We've tried poster campaigns. We tried public health. We've tried everything. Not until the government decided to introduce compulsory toothbrushing in nurseries and child smile practices did we get did we get anywhere? Now that's a that that's a pretty draconian government choice. That that is the government in, intervening in chil in children's lives, but it's also allowing those children to take control even at under five, of, of their future. De de dental decay is the biggest preventable disease in the world. And it causes hor horrible uh, disease and destruction later on in life if you don't deal with it when you're really young. So now we've got a generation of kids who have not only got all their teeth, forgive the shorthand, but they also know how to keep them and they know how to look after them. And they've had a bit of a public health intervention. But but we, we did that. C centrally, we made choices to do that. So... So Mona's right. It's a combination of government for what only government can do, not, not everything, for what government can do, but then empowering particularly disempowered young people to, to, make those, to make those choices when you give them all the information to be able to do it. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking, um, and, and this is really for all three of you, but um, I guess an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, and particularly Jenny and Jason, how would you deal with people who are vehemently against COVID vac vaccination? So, I mean, Jenny, have you got any plans there to uh, think about how you might get people to consider vaccination or? Yeah, when I, we do, a, a, we were talking about spreading the information and young people, my daughter and I do a nightly 9 p.m. It's now on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it used to be seven days a week. On Facebook, we have a, a live stream and we get about 40,000 people attend that every single night um, and when the great thing the great thing about people who are anti-vax if that's how you want to look at it or and I'm talking not people who are worried about the vaccine people who are like no not taking it it, it, it might have stuff in it more and more people on social media are like, no, that we're not platforming that debate. It, it's not a debate we're going to platform. It's like when people like the BBC or any big major company will platform a flat earther. No, don't, because it's not, it's not a thing. Don't give them a flat. Don't say this is a big art chain and he's a flat earther. Why is he speaking? Because it's not a thing. So what I do is on my Facebook is if people come on and they're anti-vax, I, I completely 
say to them, you're not welcome here because that is not a debate for me. I'm not going to debate it because it's not a thing. You need to either get vaccinated or go get information about it. That's just my personal opinion. That's why I'm not a politician and I'm not the government. I just block them because I don't want to hear people telling me that they are not taking the vaccine because as far as I'm concerned, they're just posing themselves as, as a danger. And then when we do the live stream and people come on, and it's different when people say, is there any way you can help me because I'm worried about the vaccine? And then we're no scientists. I mean, I don't know why anybody's listening to, you know, big Frankie McDade on his vaccine chat because he's not a scientist. He's a guy that, you know, that picks up the leaves in the park. He's not a scientist. Listen to the scientists. And I think the best way we can get people to talk about the vaccine and take the vaccine is for more people to visibly be done be seen taking it and doing it yeah and, and so the, yeah the, go on jason the, the country the country is it, it is about evenly split so the polling suggests about 27 million across the uk will run towards the vaccine get it as quick as they mm -hmm. can in fact they're frustrated they don't have it already so that's terrific mm -hmm. another 27 million are what we call vaccine hesitant mm -hmm. they, 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 they just want more knowledge they want to understand how did we do it so quickly what does it mean what does it do how long will it last should my granny get it should my four-year-old get it i'm trying for a baby what should i do oh all that that's terrific that, that's that's actually co common sense so th they are the ones we want to communicate with I, i'll do q and a's till 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 we're done with the 27 million J Janie can help with that group mona can help with that group in fact what what will work with that group is their own peer group so mm -hmm. mums will help with mums and 80 year olds in the care home will help each other. The anti-vax group is tiny, absolutely mm -hmm. tiny. And Janie is absolutely right. The best way of dealing with that, I'm afraid, is to ignore it. And because you're not going to persuade them. The psychology of that level of anti-science, anti-expert, anti-everything is Honestly, you can't deal with it with fact. So you, the scientific advisor can't can't fix that. There's no way of bringing them back. So so no. you sh we should invest our energy in the 27 million who have questions. Yeah. That's why we're going to do a national door drop. That's why we're on call K in the morning. I mean, that's not how I would choose to spend my 10 o'clock gig. It, that's why we're on off the ball. That's why we're at the podium every day in order to show people it, it, in a very transparent way how the companies have done this, how we've invested as a world to get us to this point, and also, to Mona's point earlier, how we're going to get it to the whole world. Because one of the one of the hesitancies is, why, why should we do this in the UK and not do it in Ethiopia and Yemen and Indonesia, mm -hmm. where, where we have to? So we, we should answer all those questions in order to help people make, then make informed choices. Yeah. So I, I've got a question here from Gordon Hill, and um, and actually we'll probably have to wrap up soon after this. I knew this would happen, we could speak for hours, but anyway, um, what Gordon's asking is that, um, is the kind of voice of COVID, how we communicate about it, distinctive in Scotland versus elsewhere? I mean, Mona, have you have you noticed how we talk about COVID and, uh, you know, we have uh, at least two very, uh, well-known distinctive voices with us in, in Jason and Janie. Is that different as to what's happening in the rest of the UK and elsewhere in the world? So I think that the one thing that I've been thinking about for the last few months um, around COVID is this issue of trust. And COVID has put the issue of trust right up there as to who do we trust to tell us what to do? whether it's politicians or whether it's a science, uh, scientific community, because there is no unanimity on so many of these points. Even if there's kind of a unity on certain aspects, you hear different things. So how you communicate um, such a global issue, I think is of the utmost importance. I do think there is a distinction just by the research, the, the statistics I've seen, that there does seem to be a higher level of trust in the leadership in Scotland than there is down south. Now that could be for a variety of reasons, um, but I think that well, people not don't necessarily want clarity. That's important. People also want leadership to say we got this wrong. We're sorry, 
And if you don't want to say sorry ever, uh, and you just mince your words and you just make things up and you just basically lie sometimes blatantly, blatantly knowing that everybody's feeling fairly vulnerable um, about this issue anyway, then I think you will see disparities. And I, I would be very surprised if this issue of trust doesn't roll over next year and the following years to uh, when we have elections, because I think it's really taken people aback as to we're getting all this information, but we're really quite unsure as who do we really trust with the information we're getting. Yeah, and do, do you think also, I, if I'm honest, the way I hear all three of you communicate, another, another word or adjective I would use to describe it is authentic. I mean, you, you really just feel that, you know, when Janie's speaking to you, it is Janie. There's not an imagined Janie that you're trying to put forward. Or the same with you, Jason. It's you that's speaking. That's what that what comes across. And uh, of course, you, Mona, as well. But um, is that different, do you think, than elsewhere? I, so so as, you, as you look around the world, the, the trust point Mona makes is, is true. The, the, I, I think... So my, it's a special day for my family today. My mum is 80 wow. today. It's a big birthday. And I think actually she might be watching because she had a free afternoon because there's no party. So we should we oh, should wish her a happy birthday. Happy but birthday, she, happy Jason, birthday. She took me, uh, she took me, she, when I was a little boy, I remember her bending down and telling me at times of crisis, revert to the truth, son. And I probably had done something terribly bad. And had to, you know, had to had to tell the truth, but I figured as long as you do that w within the boundaries you're given, with which to do it, because I'm a government advisor, so so the conversations I have behind the door are different from the conversations I have publicly. Of, of course they are. That's the nature of the job. But but as long as I continue to tell the truth, and whether you like the first minister's politics or not, right at the beginning of this crisis, she made a choice with us to make clinical voices very prominent in the communication. That isn't true in Wales, for example. It's mm -hmm. not true in some regions of Canada. It's not true in all countries. So, so she, as the leader, decided that she would be the principal voice and because she's the decision maker, but she wouldn't appear at the podium without a clinician beside her. We would do a lot of the radio and TV. We would do the adverts, all of that. I think that's the right choice for for a country. I think that's what you should. I think that's what you should do, and that that's not been universally done around the world. And that's hard for a politician. By her own admission, she she finds it quite hard to give the questions away sometimes, or or not hold all that control. Politicians that they're in those jobs because they are decision makers and they seek control. So to give that away to unelected scientists and clinicians, that's a tough. That's a really tough thing for them to do, but. I think that's part of the reason the, the trust percentages, the polling is, is good in Scotland as opposed to some other countries. Okay. Now, um, although we could talk, well, I certainly could, to, could talk to you all for hours. We've, we've kind of come to the end of our slot. And um, so I wanted to finish by asking you uh, just, just briefly, if you, can, if you can answer the same question that I'm going to pose to each of you. And that is, and I'm going to come to you first, Mona. Um, so it's been an extraordinary year this, this year where we've been uh, faced with a fairly unprecedented uh, pandemic in the, in the UK and globally and in Scotland, of course. Um, when we come out of it, and this is what we're looking at with the post-COVID futures condition, what, what's the one thing that you hope will change going forward, looking forward for a better world, not just the one that we had pre-COVID, but post-COVID, what would be better in your eyes? Mona, have you got anything that you would pinpoint? I would just say that personally speaking, I feel changed by COVID as well. And I think a lot of people in my age group who have left work, um, not because they had another job to go to, but simply because it made them reassess their life, what was important to them, what they needed to make time for, um, has made me think as well that on the one hand, it's very easy to go along with what you're doing. There's security there. There's a kind of purpose there. At the same time, that introspection that's been caused by COVID um, has made me rethink so many priorities. I don't want to sound, you know, cliched here, but I honestly would not underestimate um, how important it is to really just show more kindness. I mean, that's all most of us have been looking for 
whether in our communities and our friendships, in our colleagues, that somebody values you, that somebody cares about what you're thinking, that somebody is aware of what you're saying and feeling. Because, you know, apart from all the government stuff and all the political stuff that's happening, at the end of the day, most of us are on our own with our families for most of the time. And I think that feeling of where is my life going has hit a lot of us. But when you feel that, no, the world still values you and that the world is a kind place by and large, which I think it is, then I think that that's a trajectory we need to hold on to. Okay, a kinder world. I like that. Jenny, what, what about you? I am going to look forward to and hope that I continue with my recycling. I've realised that I don't need that many clothes this year. I don't need to buy as much. My consumption of um, consumables has been right down. And I've realised I don't need all that tat and stuff. And also, I'm really looking forward to um, training myself to wear a bra for a whole year, a whole year again. I was so enjoying not. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Jason, is there anything there that strikes a chord with you? Maybe not the latter. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping to be a live prop at Janie Godley's Fringe show. I mean, I, I, I can see... I can see myself at the podium not having to speak and Janie just does just does the voice over live. I can I can see a career developing for me there. I, I actually was gonna was gonna say kindness like like Mona did. There there are there are multiple examples around the country. I mean the mosque nearest me has been cooking three thousand meals for neighbors, for the homeless, for those around it, for, for the whole pandemic for nine months because they're not cooking for large congregations. The, there's a church near here with a food bank open every day. There's that, that, that level of community engagement, I think, is crucial to hold on to. There are real practical things. The National Health Service will never be the same again. We will have a deep public health infrastructure that we won't let loose again. We will have video conferencing appointments for the postman in Galsby so he can speak to the gastroenterologist at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary without taking four days off his work. So, so there are real practical things that we will keep. But the, but the fundamental thing I hope that we keep is that community, that, that spirit that put people on their doorsteps clapping and put little notes through doors that said, if you need anything, here's my, here's my phone number. I know you might be by yourself. I, I hope that we hold on to some of that. that. That's great. So we've got kinder, we've got less uh, obsessed by materi the material world and, um, and community. And I would add to that, I, I hope that going forward, we think less about me and more about us. And I, I think we would all have a huge benefit from that. So um, I need to draw this to a close now. And, and when we do close, can I just remind all of, all of you who've joined this conversation uh, this afternoon, thank, thank you for joining and for your interest. If you are interested in the RS, RSE Post COVID Futures Commission, it's being done for you. It's for the people of Scotland and your voice is important. And we've heard different sorts of voice uh, this afternoon and all are equally uh, valid and useful and enriching. So if you have a voice and you want it heard, then you will see our website at, uh, coming up on the screen at the end of this and send us a comment, send us a thought, send us a suggestion or a provocation and we will listen to you. Um, and we will be grateful for that input. Um, so, so with that, with thanking the audience, um, let me thank all the staff at the RSE who put this together as uh, so that we were uh, able to do this broadcast this afternoon. Tell people about it if you've enjoyed uh, listening to it so that they can get the wisdom of the voices we've heard this afternoon. Um, stay safe, all of you, and, and have a restful holiday period um, and be particularly safe during that time. So let's be kind, let's think of each other and let's not buy so much rubbish stuff that, that we don't need. I think that's our takeaway message with my grateful thanks to Mona Siddiqui, Janie Godley and to Jason Leach. Thank you very much and bye. Bye, get the door up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye.